Hello, welcome to this video. Uh, we're going to be talking about the uh, self-hosting SvelteKit with a virtual private server, Docker, Cap Rover, and uh, GitHub Actions. My name is Stanislav, let's uh, get into it. So first of all, why would you uh, do self-hosting? There are several reasons. One of those is uh, privacy and data sovereignty. So when you use cloud platforms, you're not never quite sure where that your data might be ending up. And uh, if you self-host, then uh, you do it on your own server, uh, which you can uh, put in a specific region of the world and be sure that your data doesn't uh, go anywhere other than that place. Another reason is um, that you're less reliant on uh, third party tools. So once you've started self-hosting and you're self-hosting your application, the next step is self-hosting your analytics, your observability, even your CMS. So that opens the door for those type of things. Uh, another reason is uh, portability. So uh, when you um, use a cloud platform, then you might be using uh, you know, their database, their key, key, key value store, uh, some uh, specific functions like image resizing that they provide. And uh, by building your application to be self-hosted from the ground up, you can easily um, move it between different servers without worrying about any vendor-specific things that you might be using. Another reason is uh, to avoid the cold starts. Uh, I think many people who use serverless platforms are familiar with this concept. and uh, the difference when you self-host is that you pay for a server and you pay it up front for a whole month and then you have access to that performance. So even if your app hasn't been used for, you know, for uh, hours or even days, uh, once a request comes in, it's going to be um, answered right away. So you're not going to be paying any cold start penalty. So the last reason why you might want to self-host is because of cost control. So when you're using like cloud platforms, you're usually paying on uh, metrics that can be kind of obtuse and hard to calculate. Maybe you're paying by gigabyte, hour, uh, or something along those lines. Uh, but with a virtual private server, you know that you're going to be paying, for example, $5 a month. And uh, then you can, uh, you know that that's what you're going to be paying. No more, no less. But of course, uh, self-hosting also has some uh, drawbacks. So... Um, when you self-host, you have a single point of failure, uh, which means that if your server crashes, your application stops working. I think this is uh, less of a big deal than it was back in the day. So nowadays, if you use modern web technologies like uh, Service Worker, then uh, you can make it so that your app can gracefully handle um, being uh, down for a little bit. And this is good anyway, because you might have uh, clients that are on unreliable connections. For example, people might be on the subway and uh, you know that would have the same effect as your app being down if they lose connection. Another drawback is uh, responsibility for maintenance and upgrades. So on a cloud platform, they typically, for example, update the Node.js runtime. And when you self-host, that responsibility falls on, on you. And the last uh, drawback is uh, time investment. So, you know, it's uh, very easy to download like a cool CLI tool and just uh, be up and running in a few uh, minutes with a few commands. But if you want to uh, self-host, it's uh, going to take a little bit of time investment, but you're going to be able to reap the benefits of that for months and months and years to come. All right. So why would we specifically want to use uh, Docker and uh, Caprover for this? Um, well, we developers, we are familiar with the CLI tools and we don't mind them, but uh, sometimes it's quite nice to have just a nice admin panel that you can go into and see the status of your apps, see logs, add environment variables, those types of things, and CapRover provides that. Uh, and why we use Docker for all this is because Docker lets us containerize apps. So that means that each of your apps is packaged in a container and it works independently of all the other apps and it also is protected so that uh, even if something would, were to happen inside the container, uh, it wouldn't be able to access other apps on running on the same machine. Another great feature of CapRover is one-click apps. And uh, if you use something like uh, cPanel, you're gonna know what this is about. So 
They have a catalog of uh, hundreds of different apps and uh, with just a few clicks you can install Redis or Postgres or MySQL or any number of applications including more complex ones like uh, WordPress. Caprover also has uh, continuous integration support and we're gonna show that in the demo how we will connect it to GitHub uh, CI, GitHub Actions, to have like a full CI flow. Another great feature of uh, Caprover is uh, automatic uh, SSL certificates. So uh, it's gonna uh, use Let's Encrypt and you're gonna get free SSL for all of your apps. Caprover is also uh, free and open source. So um, it's actually written in, uh, in TypeScript. So you can even uh, contribute to it if you'd like. And the last reason is uh, that uh, Caprover can actually uh, build images for you instead of using GitHub CI. So even if you don't want to use GitHub CI, you can also use this uh, stack without any other uh, tools. And so why would we use GitHub? Um, well, GitHub is the most popular code hosting platform right now. And they have a very generous free tier for public repositories when it comes to GitHub Actions. And uh, the lock-in that you can experience is pretty limited. Uh, if you really want to, you can still build your images on Caprover. But you would still need somewhere to like put your code. And uh, even though you can self-host uh, even that part with something like Gitea or Gogs, uh, it's way outside the scope of, of this tutorial. All right, so before we start, let's look a little bit of a high-level overview of what uh, Caprover actually does on your server. So you have this box here, which uh, represents your virtual private server. And uh, Caprover uh, essentially functions uh, inside of Docker. So you're going to have your um, Docker inside your virtual private server. And the cap rover is going to spin up some images for you once you install it. So one of those images is uh, Nginx. And that will be used to route all the different applications you install, as well as route the cap rover admin panel. And this uh, runs as a Docker image. And then cap rover also sets up a Docker image for its admin panel, as well as a cert bot for automatic certificate management and a few other images to um, make everything work. So that's kind of the uh, Caprover part, uh, which I've denoted here by putting little Caprover logos on the images. Uh, but that's just one, one of the parts, right? So the second part is your applications. And those also run inside Docker. Each of your apps is gonna run as a Docker container. So you can have as many uh, apps as you want, as many as can fit on the server, giving the CPU and the memory constraints uh, that the server has. And you can also run uh, uh, databases and uh, really any uh, other images that uh, you want in here. All right, so let's do a little checklist. What do we need to install Caprover? So we're going to need uh, a domain. And it doesn't have to be the full domain. If you already have a domain that you use for something, you can use a subdomain of that. And I'm going to explain how that works. You need a virtual private server to install Caprover on, and you need SSH access to that server. Uh, and then you need a GitHub account. So the steps that we're gonna do, we're gonna create a brand new virtual private server. Uh, I'm gonna use DigitalOcean for this, but you can use any server host that you want. We're gonna point a domain to our server, install Caprover, uh, and then we're gonna create a brand new SvelteKit project, uh, publish it to GitHub. We're going to set up GitHub uh, continuous integration uh, through GitHub Actions uh, and deploy the whole thing. And then just at the end, I'm going to demonstrate how you can easily add a database to your project. All right, it's time for the demo. All right, now I'm in the uh, DigitalOcean uh, control panel. And I'm going to go ahead and create a new server that we're going to use uh, together with uh, Caprover. So to do that, I go to create, and then I choose a droplet, which is what uh, DigitalOcean calls a virtual private server. And here uh, I get to pick the uh, region, and uh, you should pick something that is uh, close to your users, basically, so that the latency is as low as possible. So I'm gonna pick uh, Frankfurt, 
and then I get to choose the operating system. And for this, I recommend that you use the latest uh, Ubuntu uh, LTS version, the long-term stable version, because that's gonna get support for the longest uh, time. And then here I uh, select which uh, type of uh, server I want. And um, so what you're gonna need, uh, the cheapest server usually has, on most platforms usually has about half a gig of RAM. Um, if you're gonna be running maybe just one app, I think that is uh, fine. But if you're gonna want to be running multiple apps on your server, I would recommend to spring for one gigabyte. Uh, and that's what I'm gonna do here. Then um, it's going to, uh, uh, we're gonna choose which authentication method we want to use. And in this case, I'm gonna choose password. And I'm just gonna uh, make a very uh, simple um, password here. There we go. And I'm gonna save this for uh, uh, use later. All right, uh, and then here they also have some extra options so you can add uh, metrics to your server, which is very good. Uh, you can add um, automatic backups, which is very, uh, very nice to have in case something goes wrong or your server crashes for some reason. And they also offer you a managed database, which uh, they charge 15 bucks for, but uh, we're gonna do it for free by launching a database uh, on our server. So here you get to pick a name. I'm gonna just uh, call my server Caprover. And then I press create. All right, so as you can see, the server is creating. It is uh, gonna take a little bit of time but uh, soon we are going to have um, we're going to have our um, server and our uh, IP address for the server as well. All right, so as you can see, we have our um, server now. It's running, and we got the IP address. And I'm going to right away go ahead and uh, SSH into our uh, server. So I have a terminal here. I'm going to type. Uh, SSH root at uh, the server IP. All right, so there we go. And it's going to ask me for the password. And um, I've saved the password here, so I'm going to put that in. And uh, now I'm into the server. So uh, from here, we're just going to go ahead and install Caprover. So if we follow this, um, this guide that Caprover has, the Getting Started Guide, they're gonna advise you to start with installing uh, Docker first. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and do that. And I'm gonna go to this uh, page, which explains how to install Docker on Ubuntu. So first it asks me to run uh, this cleanup command. And I'm gonna go ahead and do that to make sure we're not, we don't have any old uh, version of uh, Docker or anything like that running. Great. Then uh, it's going to uh, ask, uh, ask us to set up uh, the um, Docker specific apt repositories. So I'm just uh, gonna paste these commands in and this is gonna install some prerequisites. And then here I'm gonna be adding the, um, uh, the apt uh, package source for uh, Docker. So I'm just uh, putting in one command at a time here. And then here I have the actual command that I think is going to uh, install Docker for us. No, not yet. Okay, one command down. Okay, so we added the new source and now we're updating it to make sure all these packages are uh, fetched. And now we're going to install Docker. All 
All right, as you can see, it takes a little bit of time, but not uh, not too long. All right, uh, if you get the screen, I think you can just uh, say OK here. Great, it's done. And then they have this command where you can check if the installation went OK. And it's going to print just hello world. Let's see if it works. It says hello from Docker. Great. So now we have the prerequisite uh, all done. And we can continue to install in Caprover. So to do that, we run a Docker command. Because if you recall, um, all of Caprover actually runs inside of Docker. So I'm just going to take the command. I'm going to paste it. And now it's going to install a cap rover for us. All right, and now the installation uh, finished. So uh, if we keep reading, it says that we should go to HTTP, the IP of our server on port 3000. Let's go ahead and try that. So I'm going to go back here, get the IP. Um, and now paste it in like this. All right. So now we have the login screen. And let's say, let's see what they say. So you should use the default password, uh, Captain42, and then I can change it later. All right. Let's go ahead and log in. All right. So it says you have successfully installed the uh, cap rover, but you still need to assign a domain and finish the HTTPS setup. All right. And then um, it's uh, telling us to do it through the terminal. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to uh, cancel out of um, the server now. I'm going to run this actually on, uh, uh, on, my, on my machine, so not on the server. So first I'm going to install the Caprover CLI. All right, and then I'm going to run this Caprover server setup. Uh, have you already started Caprover? Yes. It's going to ask for the IP address again. Let's give it that. All right, and then uh, it's going to ask us for the root domain. So he here is where um, you're going to need a um, a domain. So I have a domain here that I'm going to use that, uh, uh, that is not in use right now. And uh, I'm using Google domains here, but uh, the settings should be more or less the same, uh, regardless of which uh, DNS hosting you use. So you go to the DNS settings, and then here is where you need to add some uh, records. So there's two records uh, you need to add. Uh, one record is uh, for uh, the kind of root domain that you want to use. So in our case, we're going to use all of uh, all of this domain. And it's uh, going to be an A record, and it's going to point to the to our server. And then we're going to add another record for uh, a wildcard. So anything dot my domain. And it's also going to be an A record. And it's also going to point uh, to our server. And the reason for this is that uh, just like on Heroku, apps are going to have an automatic domain, which is going to be like your app name dot your domain dot com. All right. So this is all you need. So I'm going to save this. And uh, it, it's uh, here, it's going to take a little bit of time to propagate it. So it might not work right away, but we're going to try it in just a second. Just want to sh uh, explain how you would do it if you want to use a subdomain. Uh, so in this case, let's say you wanted to use not the root, but you wanted to something like caprover dot uh, your domain. So in this case, it works exactly the same. You would put the IP in right uh, like this, and then you would add the um, the wildcard as well. So 
So in this case, um, uh, if, if you don't want to use the full domain, this is how you would, uh, you would do it. But in our case, we're going to be using the full domain. All right. So now we have uh, all everything we need since we did the pointers. I'm going to put in the name of my domain here. And, and uh, then I'm going to set a uh, password. Again, I'm just going to make something up and uh, save that. I'm going to enter it again. All right. Uh, I'm going to enter a um, valid email address here. Uh, this is for um, Let's Encrypt so that they can uh, notify you if domains are uh, expiring or not working properly. As if they, sorry, if the certificate is about to expire and is not being renewed correctly. All right. And uh, now. Uh, Capro is actually going to go out and um, figure out the SSL certificates that are needed uh, to make the server work. And at this stage, if uh, you didn't wait long enough with the DNS record, you might um, get some sort of error. But in this case, it did seem to work okay. It's going to suggest a machine name. Let's just continue there. All right. And uh, now we're ready to use our brand new uh, instance. So I'm gonna copy the domain from here. I'm gonna paste it in here. And uh, now Captain42 is not gonna work anymore uh, because we uh, we changed the name, uh, so we changed the password. So I'm gonna put in the new password. And now we're we're in. So uh, this is the admin panel. And now we can uh, continue by creating a um, our salt GitHub. So to start with that, let's uh, go ahead and uh, create uh, an app. We're going to maybe we're going to call it just uh, salt kit. And we're going to press create. And now the app is going to be created for us. So it's going to spin up kind of like a, um, just a simple uh, container. So we, we can see here that we got a um, automatic domain here, Sveltkit dot the domain I picked for the installation. And if I go to this uh, page, I just get like a welcome a screen that tells me that my app is going to be here when I deploy it. And uh, now is a great time to um, to actually set up uh, our our app in um, in VS Code. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna just follow the uh, the guide here from Seltkit on how to create a new app. So. All right, and um, yeah, let's let's uh, let's do the demo app uh, just to have something to uh, to show. And I'm not going to use TypeScript, and I'm not going to add any of these other packages just to uh, kind of keep it brief. All right, um, so I'm going to follow the uh, guides here. I'm going to install the packages. Let's see, I need to use the correct version of Node. I'm going to use Node 18 here. Let's try it again. Okay, and then I'm um, just following the commands here that are given to me. And then I'm going to go ahead and open this in uh, VS Code. All right, now we're ready to continue. And uh, the first thing that we need to do is to actually uh, pack our SvelteKit app in a Docker container. So 
first of all. Let's make sure that it runs correctly. All right, so that seems to uh, work okay. So how do we pack this in a Docker container so we can run it in uh, Caprover? So uh, writing containers from scratch uh, is uh, takes a while. So I have a finished uh, container here, a container configuration that we're just gonna copy in. But we can uh, briefly mention some of the things that go on here. So, so basically we are starting with a node uh, image, node 19, uh, and then um, we um, basically run npm install and npm build, just like, so it's like, kind of normal stuff. And the one thing we need to do to make this work is we also need to switch to adapter node instead of adapter auto. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And install it. And um, I'm not sure if this is actually required, but I am going to set also the uh, build folder to uh, to write to build so that now when we run npm run build it's going to create a, a build folder here for us yeah so there it is and what i'm also going to do is i'm going to add that to git ignore it looks like it's already added there great um, so now we have the um, the docker file that's going to package the app and uh, then we need to um, create a GitHub Actions workflow for it. And you do that by creating a folder called GitHub Workflows. So it's two folders, first .github, then workflows. And then inside here, uh, you create a YAML file. And uh, again, uh, building a workflow from uh, scratch, it uh, takes a little bit of time. So I have prepared one here that I'm going to share with you. And what this workflow will do is um, basically it's going to uh, build the image. It's going to publish it uh, to the um, GitHub container registry. And then it's going to deploy it on Caprover. So let's first, uh, uh, let's, let's start with some things that we need to configure here, sp specifically the um, deploy and Caprover part. So it's asking us for our server, which uh, we have that, that's our uh, domain. It's asking us for the app name. It's asking us for this token. What is this token? Well, I will show you. So if you go back to, um, to the app in Caprover and you go to the deployment tab and you scroll down, there is this official CLI deploy method and uh, to use it, we need to use this app token. We need to generate an app token. There we go. So this token is what's gonna let us actually deploy. And um, if we look at the configuration, it's coming from a secrets. And secrets is something that you configure uh, on, your, uh, on your app, so in GitHub. So let's go ahead and um, and then publish this uh, repository to GitHub and then configure the secret. So I'm gonna go ahead and publish this just to a public repository. All right, and I should be able to see that if I go here. Yes, so this is the um, package that I just published, uh, sorry, the, um, this project that I just published. And then now I can go to settings for this uh, project, uh, secrets, which you can find here, actions. And then I'm gonna add a new secret. And if we look what the name of that secret is supposed to be, it's app underscore token. And the actual value is going to be the value here that we uh, got from Caprover. 
All right, so now uh, it's configured and uh, we're going to be able to access it here. Then it's asking us which image to deploy and uh, that's going to be uh, uh, this ghcr slash your username slash the uh, name of the um, repository. All right, there we go. So I have some file changes here. So this is specifically the changes we've been making. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stage those changes. And, uh, and commit them. And uh, while we're um, waiting for that, we're going to go back here actually, and there is one setting here that we need to change, and that is this container port. So when you build with adapter node, the default port is 3000, and we have to set that here for it to work properly. All right, so let's go to our project here on GitHub and uh, let's see what happens. All right, and it doesn't look like our workflow ran. Let's see what the problem is. I think I, I know it's because the branch name here has to match the, um, the actual main branch that you use. So let's try that again. All right, let's see again if something happens. All right, and there is one more setting that we need to do in the repository. And that is if you go under settings here and then you go to uh, actions, then at the very bottom here where it says workflow permissions, you need to change it to read and write permissions because otherwise uh, your build will fail because it won't have access to um, push the, um, the actual image that was built. So I'm going to just go ahead and uh, add a tiny change here so that we can rerun uh, the, um, the job. All right, and now it's uh, running. So um, again, that's gonna uh, build the image uh, on GitHub using GitHub Actions. It's gonna push it to the GitHub uh, container registry. And uh, then it's going to send a ping to our Caprover server that the image has been built and uh, that it's time to deploy it. And Caprover is gonna deploy the image for us. All right, and now our uh, build has uh, finished. Let's go back to the Caprover admin panel and uh, have a look. So if we go to the uh, deployment tab, uh, we can see here that uh, our uh, image has been deployed. This was an earlier deployment I did that I uh, had some issues with, but here we can see that the uh, image was deployed from the GitHub um, container repo. And um, you can also see the logs here. So it says listening. Um, and then if we go back here and we go to the URL here, then hopefully uh, we're gonna see the, uh, the demo app. Yeah, and here it is. And uh, it's maybe a little bit hard to see because it's so small, but it is running on our, um, uh, on our domain seltkit dot the domain name we chose. And if I want to add uh, SSL to our app now, it's very simple. All I need to do is press this enable HTTPS button and it's going to create the new uh, certificate for us. And that takes a couple of seconds because it has to contact Let's Encrypt. And then I can also pick force HTTPS here. So when I do that, I'm going to reload and we can see that connection is secure, certificate is valid, and we have our application running uh, self-hosted on our cloud uh, server. And the best thing about this is when you make a change, um, it's gonna automat automatically redeploy, and you're gonna see your uh, changes uh, live 
uh, when you push to uh, to your main branch. All right. I also promised you uh, to uh, add a little database to there to this project. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna go to apps, and instead of create new app here, I'm gonna go to uh, one click apps. And this is the uh, repo I've mentioned where you can deploy uh, images very easily that are already pre-configured. I'm gonna use the uh, Postgres image. So um, I'm gonna press Postgres. I'm gonna call it just the DB database. I can pick the um, version of Postgres I want. It's gonna suggest automatically a password for me that I'm gonna, I'm gonna save here and a default database all right that's it and i'm not going to change anything i'm just going to press deploy all right and my database is up and running and um, i even got the um, example of how to connect to it from uh, node.js but what i'm interested in is uh, this um, this domain here this is an internal domain that's going to allow my uh, saltkit app to access uh, postgres so now we have two apps. We have our Saltkit and we have our database. And in order to actually connect them, I'm gonna use this um, a little database class. So I'm gonna create a uh, lib server folder, and I'm gonna create a this uh, database class inside of it realize now that I don't have access to a TypeScript because I didn't uh, choose it. So let's go ahead and clean this out a little bit. All right. And um, I'm going to go ahead and create a, um, a API endpoint just to demonstrate the connection. So I'm going to make uh, going to make a folder in routes called API. And then I'm going to create a server.js file here and um, here we go. I'm going to clear out everything inside here and here's where I'm going to do my uh, query then. So um, result here we go didn't really help me with the path there so let's help it a little bit there we go and then um, yeah great suggestion actually uh, from uh, copilot here to just uh, get a random number and then uh, uh, return that number Actually, we're just going to go ahead and uh, return JSON from here. Yes, I think we do need to add this as well to get the first row. All right. And then uh, let's have a look at how this um, uh, system works. So. Uh, this um, database class expects an environment variable called um, db url. So this is uh, something that we're going to have to add into our app for it to actually connect to the database. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to go back into the saltkit app. We're going to go this time to app config, environment variables, add a key value pair, and uh, add this uh, environment variable called db url and we're going to paste the default value and uh, here is where we're going to have to add the um, credentials from our uh, database so first is the username and password and if i go to the uh, database it has some environment variables as well so it has this postgres user so that one is just called postgres it has the password which i'm going to enter here and then we have the actual um, domain of the database, which is this one here. So there. The port stays the same, and the name of the uh, 
database is also Postgres. Here we go. Save that. And for now, that's not going to do anything because we haven't deployed the changes yet. But if I um, were to um, stage these changes, um, there we go, and I'm going to commit them. Since we already set up the deploy flow, it's going to deploy automatically. And then in uh, just a little bit, we will hopefully see the result. All right, I had some errors when I tried to deploy that. And uh, the problem was that I put the lib folder on the wrong level. So I've moved that now. And also I need to uh, <coughs> install the uh, Postgres package, of course. All right, now the new version has been deployed. So let's see if we go then to the um, production domain. And we type slash API, which is where we put our endpoint. Then we can see that we get a random value back. And so this isn't just a random value with math.random or something. This is actually coming from the Postgres server. So we know that the connection is working. All right. And that concludes the demo. So I have just one slide left. Um, and that is kind of where do you go from here if you became interested in this uh, in this stuff. Just some tips uh, from me. You can uh, self-host uh, different analytics providers like Umami or Phantom. Uh, you can self-host uh, an observability platform uh, such as GlitchTip, which actually uses the Sentry SDK. So you can use the Sentry JS integrations, but still have your own admin panel that you uh, control yourself. You can do clustering. So Caprover supports clustering with Docker Swarm, which means that you can uh, you can put your applications on multiple machines. There's a great uh, image uh, for local Postgres backups that you can run in Docker to kind of have continuous backup every hour or ev even every like 10 minutes uh, of your production applications. And then I encourage you to look into centralized log management because um, even um, even though you can go to the app in um, in the admin panel and look at the logs, maybe you want to look further back in time. And for that, I found this app called Dozzle, which is also a Docker container, of course, that you deploy. And then you have a beautiful UI where you can see all of your logs. So thanks for sticking with me. And uh, I hope uh, everything goes well on your self-hosted journey.